Welcome back to Simple Cyber Defense. In this episode, we have a special episode where we're going to be discussing the who, what, where, and why of cybersecurity for the Cybersecurity Awareness Month. So well, let's begin. I am Carl. Hi, this is Ahmad. And we're going to get started with, with the what is cybersecurity? So you want well, to start off or do you want me to? The, well, first of all, I mean, we're both in cybersecurity, but mm -hmm. I bet you, you, you and I will not even agree on how to write cybersecurity. Oh, of course not. Right? <laughs> like, <laughs> is it one word or two, right? Yeah. You know, and, and some, some even put like a little dash in between. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's, uh, I say, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a, it's an emerging field, you know. It's the hot topic right now, and it's yeah. because of you know all the, uh, the the threats that we're 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 facing, either you know from within or outside of the country. So cybersecurity is pretty much the the practice of defending computers. Mm -hmm. uh, these computers can be you know regular computers that you use on a daily basis, or it can be servers that that corporations use, uh, mobile devices. Internet of Things, uh, electronic systems, networks, and data mm -hmm. from any type of attack, any type of threat actor. Um, you know, some also refer to it as information technology security or electronic information security. It just, you know, it's a, it applies in a variety of contexts, either you know, in business or in uh, on a personal. Personal, level. yeah. Right. And so, with this, with this. Uh podcast and YouTube channel, uh, we are here to try to take the complexities of cybersecurity and kind of simplify it for everyone to understand. Because I'm in a belief, as I was studying cybersecurity, I believe anyone can use the simple techniques to protect themselves digitally online. And as we're becoming a more online centric lives because more and more things are starting to be connected to the internet so that means more and more of our data is being exposed and sometimes we have control of it sometimes we don't but it doesn't mean that we can't do anything to protect ourselves um right you know the uh, just as you mentioned, you know, it's 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 a global threat, right? It's yeah. not something that's local, and it's it's evolving, uh, it's growing rapidly, uh, and you can see it as, as if you follow our podcast, you see the number of data breaches each year are getting more. more the more. number is getting bigger, and the 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 information gathered from those those breaches are getting yeah, more and more massive. More. You know, just mm -hmm. because of the number of people that are using those data. Um, you know, there is, it, it's usually, usually it, it's over year over year. If you look at the statistics, it's it more than, more than doubles Yeah. every year. And I think that's due to more of our, more of our lives becoming online because if you think about the early stages of the internet, how much data really was there. So right. most of the attacks were just more about destroying your computer versus stealing data because when we started off with the internet we didn't really think of it as a way to do business or to share information with each other that was just mostly done by the government sectors or the or the uh, universities most of the people use the internet just to like send out emails or to watch videos, like simple things. We didn't really interact with it all that much. But now the internet has grown to a place where we're sharing almost every detail of our lives online. And with all that data being out there, attackers are finding ways to capitalize on that and to steal that data so that they can make a profit out of it. Right. Now, um, 
Carl, uh, you you mentioned you know a lot of a lot of uh, the ass, a lot of the assets that are that are being gone after is information, mm -hmm. right? Um, but it's not only information is kind of like the ultimate prize, right? So yeah. how is this information protected? Are are they are there layers to protect in to protect this information? In the I most ideal world, yes, but unfortunately, a lot of companies don't want to implement these layers of security because it costs them money. And there are many different things that companies can do to protect not only their infrastructure, but also the data that's inside it. Uh, the first layer would be putting up firewalls and perimeters to keep the bad guys out of their network altogether and then so that's network security yeah network right? security yep and that's part of cyber security right? yeah it's a subset of cyber security and then okay. when you breach into the network and you have access to the network now the next step is to Im implement what's known as access controls which basically says okay if this person has this right these rights they can access these data sets in these different servers and the bad guys know that so what they'll do is they'll attack a computer that's trusted on there and try to use that computer to then gain access to the servers that hold the data now after they get in through there the last layer is to encrypt the data as it's sitting on the server not being used and again that's in the most ideal world world situations which not always done in the real world because unfortunately like i said it takes time and money to implement all these different securities now these are just like the basics there are a lot more complicated tools that they can use, like detection and antivirus malware stuff. And many different teams monitoring the network flow to make sure that everything is good. But for the end users like us, for a personal level, we don't have to get that deep into it. All we have to do is just make sure that we follow simple steps to protect our data the first being if we don't want everyone to know about it don't put it online that's the best thing to do because if your data is not out there it can't be stolen and the next layer I would say is to make sure that you update all your software so that it doesn't have the vulnerabilities that the attackers can leverage against you to be able to steal your data. So that's, in, in other words, that's application security, right? Yeah, how application security. Application and how the, those applications are developed, developed right? yep. with the security mindset. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we got network, application, and then after we make sure all of our applications are secured, the next thing to do is to make sure that if we have any data on our on our computers or cell phones or something that we don't want to get out there, we could either encrypt it so that if it does get stolen, it can't be read by the bad guys. Or what we could do is remove it from those from being stored on our computers and put it onto like a USB drive so that it's not connected to our network so that it is just completely offline out of the reach of anyone except for you who could physically plug in the USB device onto your computer um so that's now that takes us to another aspect yeah. of cybersecurity, which is information security, information right? security yep. and, and it's, and it's a shared responsibility, right? You're mm -hmm. responsible for the data that you have 
and then whoever you're sharing that information Nations, with, they also have that they're responsible. responsible for the security of that information, mm -hmm. whether it's in storage or she, you know, is or being in use, address, address or in transit, right? Or transit or in use, because sometimes, like your bank would use your private information to update your your uh, banking information, or your doctor may need to update your health records because you went in for a visit, and things like that. And then the last bit of security is what's known as cloud security. So every time that you use Dropbox or Google Drive or any other cloud storage to store your files on there, it has a need for it to be protected because there are many stories of Amazon cloud buckets that were not fully protected and anyone had access to all that data in there. Well, the companies didn't know that and they put a lot of personal data in there and some bad guy came around and just copied all the data in there from that bucket. And it could have been prevented if the person who created that cloud storage put in implementations to stop anyone from accessing that data, just a, like password protecting it or putting up firewalls to say only accept sources from this IP address and things like that. Okay. Um, and I also, I think there is a couple of other things that may fall under the umbrella of cybersecurity, right? Which mm -hmm. is operational security, right? Which yeah. is, includes like the, the, the process and the decision of handling the, the data and the assets, right? Mm -hmm. uh, physical security may fall under that, you know, what, you know, yeah. uh, protecting, you know, uh, we don't think about it that way, but cameras that you put in place to deter people from doing things that they're not supposed to be doing locks and keys, mm -hmm. um, or also uh, trap doors, right. Or also looking out for skimmers. That is a physical We're security for skimmers, right? Because we had a whole episode about that where. Right. People could easily just put on little devices to just steal credit card information all day long. And that falls into right. a physical security because you have to be physically looking out for these devices. Right. And um, also, I would say, if when, that, when all of that fails, how can you? How can a business or can you recover? It's called disaster recovery, mm -hmm. you know, and, and business continuity plans and you know the, and risk mitigation all that that all falls under that big umbrella mm -hmm. and also what we're doing now which is end user education yeah. right because like we mentioned it's it's such a broad field and the responsibility is shared that you have to if you're using an, 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 an internet connected device you have to have that education on how yeah. to be a responsible user yeah because everyone is responsible from you and I to person Joe over there who's just uploading pictures onto their onto Facebook or whatever, it is a shared responsibility. Everyone needs to pitch in anywhere that they can. And if we just take these attacks very lightly, they're gonna happen more often and a lot more data is gonna be taken. I don't know about you, but I don't want to become a victim. I want to do everything I can to protect myself. I mean, granted, there's only so much we can do as non-business people with unlimited monies, but at least it'd be something, and that's better than nothing. Right. So, now, we talked about you know, what cybersecurity is, the different layers of it. Um, I want to talk about what are the threats, mm -hmm. um, the types of threat actors that can attack me or a business that cybersecurity as a science kind of uh, brings to light. Yeah. 
So there's many different attackers. Like the most well known are those what they call as hackers or the black cat hackers who just sit behind keyboards all day and just break into networks and steal information. And then there's those that are called the attackers that are known as like insider threats or ins insider vulnerabilities, I guess. They're trying to get away from certain... They're trying to get away the stigma of calling it an insider threat because not all people who fall in this category are malicious. Some people are just naive and just fall right. tricks to like a, a phishing attack. Right. These people are basically either willingly breaking certain cybersecurity rules to harm the business or they're unknowingly doing it. Like clicking on a bad link and then downloading malware. So that can that's the same true with ourselves too. We can be our own threat where if we aren't diligent in keeping up with the phishing techniques, then we can easily fall for some some of the simplest phishing emails or even sometimes a phone call. Like you may get a phone call from someone who's pretending to be from the IRS saying that you owe back taxes and that you have to pay them up right away or else they're going to call the cops and arrest you. But in reality, it's just some guy somewhere else just pretending to be the IRS. And through that fear, we don't think logically and we just rush into the situation like, okay, I got to fix this, I got to fix this, I got to fix this. And I have to just do what they say, otherwise, oh, I don't want to go to jail. <clears throat> and so, so we got the black hat hackers, the insider threats, and then you have those that are like the hacktivists. The hacktivists, yeah. Right. But their their targets are mostly the corporations more than individuals, unless they're like political leaders. They usually hack in a way to protest something that's being done that they think is an injustice. Like, for example, there was a time where recently where the anonymous hacking group went after a, a web hosting company that hosted many what they call alt-right political websites to try to try to what they believe was to spread light on very hateful kind of messages that they were spreading and so what they did was they attacked the web host and got a lot of personal information from all these different websites and then publish them online and say, okay, see, this is what they're doing. They're so evil or whatever the case may be. There were times when people went after certain government websites and shut them down or defaced them by changing the web pages enough to where it was makely, basically making the government look bad. So there's many different reasons and methods that they use to get their goals, which is to what they believe is righting a wrong. Whether it's right or wrong, it, that's up to debate, and we're not here to debate that kind of issue. Um, so then after the hacktivist, then you have what's known as the ransomware groups. Their main goal is to sometimes steal, inform steal all your files and then encrypt them and then once they are encrypted you want those files so badly that they leave a message on your computer saying hey if you want these if you want these files back pay us a certain amount of money in bitcoin and we'll give you a decryptor key which will unlock all these files so that you can use them again many different companies have been hit by this like the colonial pipeline uh, the meat some meat packing plants and 
hospitals even got affected by this ransomware. But this can also hit personal people too. It could hit anyone really who just gets infected by this malware and all your computers or all your computer files are encrypted unavailable to you unless you either pay up for the ransom or restore for backups which many per people personally may or may not be doing on a regular basis so okay so it, you all you mentioned attacks on on government Mm -hmm. as well and the way i would kind of generalize this and put it in a bigger bucket is i would bring this into cyber crime which is you know anyone who goes uh whether it's in a single actor or a group of or a group or groups that are targeting a system for financial gain right mm -hmm. um and, and they cause, you know, uh, disruptions. The second, I would say, is more like cyber attacks, and that's more against governments, um, you know, and it's politically politically motivated, uh, and it's a, it's a larger scale, and it's usually carried out by nation states. And then I would say another one, it would be uh, uh, cyber terrorism, mm -hmm. right, which would be used to, to cause also disruption, to cause fear, uh, to cause panic, um, and then we, we can fit, you know, those types of, of actors under those like bigger umbrellas. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. um, so now you had mentioned that someone can get fished or get social engineered into clicking on a link and then that link would download malware, right? And malware is just means a malicious software, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and that's in, 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 that's generally the most common type of cyber threat. And sometimes it can be unintentional by a script kitty. You know, he just does it and yeah. it, 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 it hits you. Um, I think it would be a good idea to kind of mention like different types of malware and how to protect ourselves as end users yeah. Yeah. from those types of malware. So what do you think are the most common types of malware that can affect me as an end user? So on a personal level, there are, I think, I would say three main different malware types. One being what's known as a Trojan horse, which is malware that's disguised as a legitimate software. Like sometimes you may go to a website that offers a paid version of a software for free. And when you download and install this software, it installs the software as it's intended to be used. But also what it do, it'll install some other software somewhere secretly behind the scenes, which will allow the attacker to gain access to your computer, both unknowingly and any time that they want to. So then the second type of malware, which is, which we discussed already was uh, ransomware, which would encrypt all your files, make it so that it's impossible for you to access them unless you either pay the ransom or restore from backups. And then the third type of malware, I would just say, is like general viruses. These are mostly things that are very destructive in nature, where they will just go in and start deleting files or just start spying on all your key logs so that every time you put in your password or your credit card information, it copies that information and sends it off to the attacker. And some not so common viruses will be more destructive to the hardware where they would modify it in such a way that it'll overheat and burn out. Usually those are more targeted towards people that someone just has a 
grudge against. So if you upset someone online and they want to get back at you, they'll just infect your computer with a certain virus that will just blow a major component into your computer so it won't work anymore. Okay. Now, those are, just like you said, you know, those are very common and it can happen to, to any of us. Yeah. Uh, I have a few tips and, you know, which are things that we have shared in detail in some previous episodes and how you, how can you protect yourself against mm -hmm. cyber attacks? Uh, number one is keep your computer updated. Yep. Keep your, your operating system updated. Keep your, all your, uh, applications on your computer and your, and on your mobile device updated, any firmware, any patches, keep that updated. Um, second, which, you know, most of us should do is even if, if you get a paid version is get a paid version of an antivirus software. Mm -hmm. Usually those free, free versions of soft uh, of antivirus are better than nothing. Yeah. But usually open source is not as supported and you don't get uh, the new, you know, virus signatures in time. Right. Yeah. It's not as protected. Um, another one which we talked about on, on our podcast before is using strong passwords and using a password manager so you don't have to reuse the same password. Because imagine if your password gets uh, compromised once, they have access That's to all, everything. Your, all your yep. access, right? Um, and uh, Carl, you had mentioned, you know, phishing and, and clicking on emails and or links that you don't know who they're from. So don't open email attachments from anyone that you don't know. Yeah. Don't click on, on links in any email from anyone you don't know or, or even someone you know. You know, if it's if it looks fishy, it, it, it is fishy. Yeah. It'll do something to your computer. And, you you know, if you don't have an antivirus, mm -hmm. you're not going to catch it. Yeah. Right. But there is one website that you could use to scan certain attachments that you are kind of weary about, and that's called a Virus Total. This is a website that's run by Google. What it will do is it'll take the attachment that you download to your computer, you upload it to the Virus Total, and it will scan it to many different virus antivirus programs, and Nice. It will flag it if it has malicious uh, software in it. Or if it's not, it'll say, okay, it's good. But it's not It's not always foolproof. But again, it's better than absolutely nothing. So it's like I'd say probably nine times out of ten, it will catch the malicious software in there. Now, Carl, how do you get that file in, a, in your attachment into VirusTotal without downloading it on your computer? Well, it's okay to download certain things like PDFs and pictures as long as you don't open them. They don't run the executables. Like, but executable files like EXEs and Python scripts are a little bit more dangerous because sometimes those can run without you even opening them. Just downloading them is enough to have it run. But PDFs and pictures take the user to actually open them for the virus to be activated. So with those and Word documents are another worst offender of <laughs> These right. things. As long as you don't open those types of files, you're okay to download them on the computer, then upload them to Virus Total. But if it's an EXE file, I would just clear, steer clear of that altogether. Unless you 100% know that it's legitimate and not malicious at all. Okay. Perfect. Um, I think another uh, final tip, which is something that we all fall victim to, is. Avoid using unsecured Wi-Fi networks. Yeah, you know, towards the end of the month, you're a little short on your data, and like, okay, I'll, I'll join this open network. Well, this opens you up to an on-path attack or a man-in-the-middle attack, mm -hmm. which any information that you send from your device to anywhere, someone can have full, clear view in clear text yeah. of what you're doing. So, and if you must do it. Mm -hmm. then use a VPN, right? You yep. Make sure you have a VPN client and whatever host that you're using, whatever device that you're using, and do it that way. Yeah, um, but just also make sure that you vetted your VPN because 
not right. all VPNs are good, and right. just make sure you you do your due diligence and research the company and make sure that they're not going to be a malicious company because there are some out there that claims, oh, we don't save your files or data or anything, but they're lying. <laughs> and there are some that don't use strong encryption for their VPN, so they're easy to crack into because all they care about is just trying to get money. So again, just research the company and make sure that they are a legitimate one. Usually the big names like... Uh, um, ExpressVPN and uh, ProtonVPN, those types of VPNs are usually a good bet to go on. But the smaller names or unknown names are a little bit more sketchy and kind of, I don't know if I should be using this. Especially stay away from free VPNs because, again, if you're not paying for it, you are the product. And one, one of the things that you'll see, and, and VPN providers know this, if you see them advertising hard, hey, we don't keep your data, we don't keep track of that, we don't have to give your data to anybody, know that that's legitimate. If they don't yeah. mention it, then know that they, they have a copy of your data, yeah. know that they will sell your data. Yeah, because legally they can't advertise something and then not actually right. fall through on it. Because if you can prove that they're lying to you in an advertisement, especially in the U.S., I don't know about other countries, but that does open them up for liability and things like that. And I honestly think European-based VPNs are better than U.S.-based VPNs. Yes, because, you have because of the rules well, not only that, but then you got the five lo the five I eyes, which is United States, United Kingdom, Australia. Um. Italy, and I forgot what the fifth one was, but basically what they came together to say that they will basically spy on their citizens and sh share the data with each other so that they can catch criminals as they their excuse is for, but we all know that they always say that that's the excuse, but it's really just to control the population, let's just face it. Again, that's a different topic. We're not going to get too deep into that because, again, we're strictly security-based and we're not going to get into any of these wild conspiracies or political debates because that's not what we're about. We're strictly security-centric. But, yeah. yeah. And... If you want to learn more about the malware, we do have a malware series on our YouTube page that you can go watch some videos that we've done about malware and what you can do to protect yourself against it. Perfect. I, yep. I, I don't have anything to add, Carl. Right. Do you have anything to add to this? No, I think, nope, we, I think we did really good. And remember, October is not just the scariest month of the year. <laughs> because of Halloween, but it's also the cybersecurity awareness. So just go out and learn as much as you can and just protect yourself because, let's face it, the big businesses are only going to be protecting themselves and they're not going to be protecting you. So with that, we're going to end this episode and we hope to see you in the next one. All right, see you. If you like what was in this episode, please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing with others. For more information, to suggest a topic, or to donate, head over to SimpleCyberDefense.com.